Welcome to the League of Women Voters, Klickitat and Skamania County's 2020 Virtual Candidate Forums. Norma? Good evening and welcome. We're recording tonight's forum. I'm Norma Benson, a member of the leadership team of the nonpartisan League of Women Voters of Washington, Klickitat and Skamania County's at-large group. The League of Women Voters of Washington, Klickitat and Skamania County's, along with the Goldendale Sentinel, and the Skamania County Pioneer are pleased to present to you the candidates for Washington State Office of Legislative District 14 State Representative Position 1, Chris Corey and Tracy Rushing. Ever since the founding of the League 100 years ago, the League of Women Voters has been a nonpartisan political organization. We encourage the informed and active participation of citizens in government. As a League, we do not support or oppose candidates factions, or political parties. The League's mission statement is empowering voters, defending democracy. The vision statement is we envision a democracy where every person has the desire, the right, the knowledge, and the confidence to participate. The forum is an opportunity for these candidates to present their views and positions so that you, the voter, can make a more informed decision when you mark your ballot. The State League is also sponsoring other forums around the state for other statewide offices. You can find up-to-date information on the state website, lwvwa.org. The League also sponsors an online voters pamphlet with candidate and issue information at vote411.org. Most importantly, in order to vote, you must be registered to vote. You can do that online or at an elections office near you. Our Vote 411 site has more information. And now to get into the forum, I introduce our moderator, Tammy Kaufman, who will briefly explain the forum procedures. Tammy has been active in both Klickitat and Skamania County since moving to the area in 2008. She is the past president of the Rotary Club of White Salmon Bingen, has served as a volunteer firefighter and EMT, is a charter member of the One Gorge Bi-State Regional Advocacy Organization and currently serves as a Skamania County appointee to the Columbia River Gorge Commission. Thank you, Tammy, for joining us this evening. Thank you, Norma, and good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Welcome to both of our candidates this evening, Mr. Chris Corey and Dr. Tracy Rushing. The candidates have received the ground rules for tonight's forum in advance and have agreed to abide by them. For the audience, here are a few of our guidelines. The candidates did not receive our questions in advance. The first set of questions were written by the sponsoring organizations. We will then ask questions from the public that were submitted before tonight's forum. The candidates have agreed to stay on topic and will have 60 seconds to respond to each question. Each candidate has been given one challenge card. At the conclusion of a question, after all answers have been given, the candidate may address the moderator by raising his or her hand and stating that he or she would like to use their challenge card to follow up on something that another candidate stated. The challenging candidate will then have 30 seconds to state the challenge, and the challenged candidate will also get 30 seconds to answer the challenge. Each candidate will only receive one challenge card to use during the entire forum. We will have the timekeeper visual to all participants. The timekeeper screen will go red when the time is up. If necessary, I will interrupt any candidate to complete their sentence and then discontinue their answer once the allotted time has been exceeded. So that we all can focus on the candidates during the forum, the webinar chat function has been disabled. If you have any questions, please email the League of Women Voters at the address on your screen. And I don't know if it is there, so let me give it to you. LWVKS, LWVKS at LWVWA.org. As with everything else right now, we are learning to how to modify traditional in-person events to virtual ones. The League of Women Voters records and retains a full unedited copy of all candidate forums. If any portion of a League forum is redistributed out of context to make a candidate appear to say something they did not say, or edited to make a candidate look bad or in any other way that they did not actually look during the original forum, then the League of Women Voters will alert the media, provide the unedited video for comparison, and file the appropriate complaints with any applicable go governing authority. 
All candidates who are on the, on the ballot for the Washington State Office of Legislative District 14 State Representative Position 1 were invited to this forum and they are both here tonight. We now will have time for introductions. The order of candidates begins with the order that the candidates appear on the ballots. Dr. Tracy Rushing will go first and Mr. Chris Corey will go second. Okay, now we will have time for the candidates for a three minute introduction. Dr. Rushing, please tell us a little bit about yourself and why you are running for office. Thank you, Tammy. Um, and thank you everyone for being here this evening. Um, I'm very grateful. Those who typically participate in these forums, I think are already very invested in our community and you are the reason that we're already such a strong community. So I really appreciate you being here this evening. Um, I am a resident of White Salmon, Washington. Um, I'm an ER physician here locally and I'm also a mom of three kids. I'm actually someone who really never had any prior political aspirations, um, no plan to enter politics, up until I saw that my opponent had filed a lawsuit up against um, our state's public health measures at the start of this pandemic. Um, I, based on what I was seeing in the emergency department at the time, felt like this was a direct affront to the health of the families that I was trying to take care of and I think that it absolutely um, contributed to the disease and death that we're seeing throughout our district, especially around Yakima. And I felt like I needed to act. Um, I am someone who believes that our businesses thrive when our people thrive. And I think both, we're failing at both right now because of a lack of evidence-based decision-making. Um, I think that our Choosing between economy and environment is really a false choice. And same thing, I think we're failing at both right now because of a lack of evidence-based decision-making. Um, but despite all that, I think this particular moment in time is a very unique opportunity for us. Um, I think it's an opportunity for us to come together as a community to really figure out what our values are and to get creative with solutions then we take those solutions to the Capitol to continue building this community in a way that works for all of us, not just the select few. Um, so, I mean, really in short, I am here because I want to work with you. Um, I want to work for us. Um, I, I consider this area my home, um, my family, my family's home for the rest of my life, hopefully. So thank you for taking the time to be here this evening and I look forward to answering your questions throughout tonight. Thank you, Dr. Rushing. Now, Mr. Chris Corey, please tell us a little bit about yourself and why you are running for office. Well, thank you, Tammy. Um, you seem to have uh, quite a long list of stuff you're working on in our Valley, so I appreciate that. Um, I also wanna take a second to thank the League of Women Voters, the Skamania County Pioneer, as well as the Golden Dale Sentinel for putting this on. Uh, it's, you know, it's a, it's a brave new world when it comes to uh, campaigning and politics. So it's nice to be able to get out and uh, sit down and have a conversation that people can watch and learn from, ask questions from. So I think that all makes us better and more informed voters. Um, so my name's Chris Corey. I am your current state representative here in the 14th Legislative District. I ran for office the first time in 2018 on a simple premise. I wanted to represent the people and businesses of Central Washington and make sure that uh, our way of life, our values and our priorities were represented and protected in Olympia. Uh, I ran for a variety of reasons, but most of those were, you know, I'm a father and a husband. I have uh, four children. We are foster parents, we're active in our community. And I wanted to make sure that policy making that happened in Olympia was reflective of the entire state, not just the Puget Sound corridor. Far too often we see policies that are drafted, guided and passed by people who don't understand central Washington. They don't understand the rural economy. They have a rough understanding of agriculture and you can see it in their policies and practices. I've been a champion for our district in Olympia. I've worked with both sides of the aisle to get stuff done. I've worked to make sure that I'm educating my Puget Sound uh, legislators on what it means to be a resident of the 14th legislative district. And I'm proud of what I've accomplished. I've you know, worked on passing bills that are really important to not just our district, but to the state. Uh, that includes P3, 
PTSD support for our 911 operators. I had the fortunate privilege last year to spend some time working with our emergency communications folks and saw that there was a definite need in our state to help provide uh, additional services for people that really are answering the phone and being the first line of defense um, in emergency calls. I've worked with a constituent who had concerns in accessing snow park lands uh, and, and didn't know where to turn. So in my first term in 2019, I spent time working with uh, the State Parks Department to come up with legislation that would allow for easier access and easier use for the Discover Pass. Um, I spent a considerable amount of time in the south part of the district working with residents in White Salmon to help pass legislation that would draft model climate policy for schools and helping make sure students and parents get the support they need. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm really excited to represent the uh, 14th Legislative District and I'm, I'm hoping to earn your vote to go back and continue fighting for the families and businesses here in Central Washington. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Corey. Okay, we'll begin with our questions. And as a reminder, there will be 60 seconds for each candidate. So our first question, what are the most pressing issues for, state, for the state legislature in the next session, especially for the upcoming general fund budget? We will begin with Mr. Corey. That is a great question. It's a pressing question and it's one we should be addressing now. Unfortunately, um, our calls to have a special session to um, look at how we can fix a $9 billion shortfall um, have been unanswered. It sounds like we won't be meeting until after election day. And that's disappointing. Um, I and other representatives were elected to make tough decisions and to go do the work for the people of our district. And right now that work's simply not being done. And every, every moment we wait uh, is a moment that puts us in greater jeopardy and more, I'm afraid, um, more cuts will need to be made and more drastic measures taken. Uh, we can't wait on federal spending to try to bail us out of the situation. We need to meet now. And there are proactive steps. The last two years, we've spent um, an incredible amount of money on new funding. And I think that if we uh, use our, our time and our resources well, we can reprioritize some funding and protect vital services. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Corey. And now Dr. Rushing, what are the most pressing issues for the state legislature in the next session, especially for the upcoming general fund budget? So I agree with Mr. Corey that the, the budget is something that needs to be addressed up front. Um, however, I think that that's a very difficult thing to do while we still do not have the pandemic adequately managed, ex especially here in central Washington. Um, I think that there are reasons to start having those discussions right now. Um, however, the more immediate discussion is what are we doing to get through this moment in time? And if we're not able to get our businesses back open because of disease burden, if we are overloading our hospitals and unable to care for people who are getting sick, then we really are at a loss to be able to make objective decisions with what those budget choices need to be. So the first thing needs to be managing the pandemic, and then we can decide exactly how to take um, a chisel or a scalpel to the budget. Thank you, Dr. Rushing. So moving on, next question. Do you support replacing the Hood River White Salmon Interstate Bridge? If so, how will you help make that happen? And if not, why not? We will begin with Dr. Rushing. That's an interesting question. Um, I do feel like that's more of a collaborative effort um, between my area in particular and the Hood River area. Um, so I think there's many more parties involved in that conversation than just our district per se. Um, I am in favor of making repairs to that bridge in particular, potentially considering a replacement. Um, obviously we're at a, a point right now where funding is going to be an ongoing conversation. Um, however, from a safety standpoint, from a transportation standpoint, and from an industry standpoint, um, both because of the agricultural industries around here and because of our tourism industry, I think addressing the issues with our current bridge is an important conversation. Um, but again, there's, there's other parties outside of our district who need to be involved in those conversations. Thank you, Dr. Rushing. And now, Mr. Corey, do you support replacing the Hood River White Salmon Interstate Bridge? If so, how will you help make that happen? If not, why not? 
So I think that that's a great question and I do support replacing the bridge. I think it fits our long-term strategic goals along the uh, Columbia River. And it's something that I've been working on in the legislature. Um, you know, we, we may sh there may be a river between Oregon and, our, and Washington, but uh, we have a lot of common concerns there. So we do spend time in the legislature working with our counterparts in Oregon, as well as businesses and industries and ports that are affected by that. It is a long-term strategic plan that I think is going to rely on Washington and Oregon to come together to, uh, to fund and build that bridge. And it's an important one. I mean, you have, obviously, there's transportation needs to serve uh, the district. There is uh, recreational needs, but there's also health and safety issues with making sure we have functioning working bridges in the event of emergencies, like we saw several years ago on the Oregon side. So having um, access to uh, roads on both Oregon and Washington, I think is important, and I would support building and replacing the bridge. Thank you, Mr. Corey. Moving on to our next question. Are the concerns of voters in your district being equally and adequately addressed across the political spectrum? We will begin with Mr. Corey. Thank you. So I would say there's probably, there's a lot to that question, and I guess I'll address it as such. Um, there are a variety of needs in the 14th Legislative District. We're a very geographically diverse area. We have a large portion of the Yakima Nation. We have um, you know, a lot of agriculture. We have a lot of dairy, or not dairy, excuse me, we have a lot of grazing. We have a lot of other things going on. So it's important to represent the entire district. And what I've done in my first term as a state representative is make sure that I'm not just focused on Yakima, even though I live up here, um, I'm regularly down in the south part of the district. I held open office hours, obviously pre-COVID, where I would meet with any and everyone who wanted to talk about issues. I've maintained a very open communication with um, anybody, regardless of party, whether I agree with them or not. If they had uh, political concerns or you know an issue they wanted to address, my office was there to serve them and will continue to serve them. Thank you, Mr. Corey. And now Dr. Rushing, are the concerns of voters in your district being equally and adequately addressed across the political spectrum? I think the answer to this question is very clearly no, they are not being adequately um, responded to across the political spectrum. I think the pandemic has really illuminated that for us here. Um, and you know, Mr. Corey speaks of the geographic diversity here. It is in fact a large district. However, on the community level, um, our various um, groups and individual families here are struggling. Um, we're struggling more now than we were before, and we have not seen meaningful effort from our local leaders to help get us through this stage. We need help to get our businesses back open. We need help to keep our families safe. And there is obvious discrepancies between where one lives and the resources afforded to one right now. Thank you, Dr. Rushing. Moving on to the next question. How do you currently use science to inform your decision making? We will begin with Dr. Rushing. Um, interesting question. I, I feel like, um, you know, with my job um, in, the, in the emergency department, science-based, evidence-based decision making is something that I rely on on a daily basis. So it is well wired in my brain. Um, I think that we typically, um, I think all of us use evidence-based decision-making to some extent, but for some reason recently in our policies, we've gone away from that. We've started to make very emotional-based decisions. And I think that's resp responsible for why we're seeing the increased burden from the pandemic right now. It's definitely contributing to some of our budget shortfalls as well. So I think evidence-based decision-making is the only way to move us forward, um, both from a budget standpoint and from a health and community standpoint. Thank you, Dr. Rushing. Mr. Corey, how do you currently use science to inform your decision-making? Oh, thank you. We certainly do spend a lot of time, especially now in the uh, era of coronavirus, talking about data and science. And I think it's something that's important. It's something that definitely is factored into decision-making on the legislative level. Um, and that runs across the spectrum, whether it's looking at policies that impact schools to the budget, it's across the board. Um, I myself am a big believer in finding the, the most data that you can on certain subjects, talking to the experts and relying on them 
to, uh, to, to fuel your decision making. I think that's very important and science obviously has a critical role in that. Thank you, Mr. Corey. We will now begin with questions that were submitted by the public in advance of the forum. So the next question, we are now in wildfire season. If elected, what will you do to reduce wildfires and how can you help your constituents prepare for a local wildfire event? And we will begin with Mr. Corey. Thank you. That's obviously a great question. We were talking about before this event, you know, what the smoke looked like. And what we're seeing now is years of, of mis, mismanagement of our forests. Um, most of the fires that have been caused in the last two weeks have been uh, man-made, intentional and unintentional. So um, those, those fires spread larger and larger because we are not properly maintaining our, our state forest lands. And on, a, on another issue that is, is harder to advocate for on the state level, our federal lands aren't being um, logged, grazed, thinned in ways that they should be. Uh, there is no doubt that we are having you know, hotter summers, which can lead to drier climates and drier temperatures. But if we're not proactively going out and reducing fuel loads, we're going to continue to see this. Um, I think it's important to recognize that. And I've worked with uh, the Depar um, Department of Natural Resources Commissioner Hillary Franz to make sure that we have the resources in place, not only to fight the fires, but that we can work to prevent them ahead of time. Thank you, Mr. Corey. Dr. Rushing, we are now in wildfire season. If elected, what will you do to reduce wildfires and how can you help your constituents to prepare for a local wildfire event? Um, so in contrast to what Mr. Corey said, um, managing our forest land is just one small piece of the puzzle for this. This has been a brewing issue for a long time. I think people who have been paying attention to what's been going on in our environment are not surprised to see what's happening now. Um, yes, we do need better forest land management, but that is again, just one small piece. This again comes down to the evidence-based decision-making. And we have good data for the choices that we should be making right now, um, especially from a prevention standpoint. Um, it is great that we're working to support our firefighters better. I am so thankful that we have great crews in our area to help us when this happens, but prevention is what we need to be focusing on. And unfortunately, we have not addressed that well with the environment and we've not addressed that well with general management in our district. Thank you, Dr. Rushing. Moving on to our next question. By state law, county sheriffs are partisan positions. Would you support changing this to nonpartisan and why? We'll begin with Dr. Rushing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that this is a this is a um, an area where I think it depends on where you live. Um, in our district, in particular, I think that there would be some benefit to this being a nonpartisan position. Um, I think with the general trend here over the last um, couple years things have felt more polarized. And I think our law enforcement is, is a group that should represent all of us. And you know, taking away a letter after a name goes a long way for making people feel like that person or that group really does stand there for them as well. Um, so yes, in our district in particular, I think that it's, a, it's worth considering. I don't necessarily think it's the prescription for all districts, but here, yes, we should have that conversation. Thank you, Dr. Rushing. And now moving to Mr. Corey. By state law, county sheriffs are partisan positions. Would you support changing this to nonpartisan and why? So that's an interesting question. I haven't really thought much about that. We, we talk a lot about some of the statewide positions that may or, not be, may or may not be partisan like our Secretary of State, but not really with the sheriffs. Um, I think communities are very in tune with uh, law and order and what's going on within their counties. So um, I believe that they would make a decision based on the quality can qualities of the sheriff candidate, not necessarily if there's an R or a D by their name. Um, and I think that uh, leaving it as is is fine. If you did change it, uh, you'd have to change it across the entire state. I think that uh, there's been some conversations on the west side about eliminating the sheriff's office as an elected position and moving it to an appointed position, which brings up a whole nother set of questions. Um, I believe that people are, are smart enough and wise enough to look at the candidates and make the decision for who's going to best protect their communities. Thank you, Mr. Corey. Moving to our next question. 
If you were to give advice to all of the kids watching, what would you say? We will begin with Mr. Corey. That is a fantastic question. It's actually um, a topic that I was able to talk about on the House floor in 2019. Uh, we host every year a Children's Day where we bring children into the legislature. My family happened to be there and I, and I got to deliver a message. And, you know, I would tell people, I would tell kids that um, you live in a land of great opportunity, that you are blessed to live in an area that has uh, tremendous resources and that if you apply yourself and work hard, there's no limit to what you can achieve, regardless of your gender, your sexual orientation, whoever you are, if you are committed to becoming a better person and committed to what you wanna do in life, you have the opportunity to do it here in America. I would also encourage you to focus on your education, to focus on your development and make sure that uh, you give back to the community that's investing a lot in you as well, because uh, you know they are our next generation and we wanna make sure that uh, they're, they are uh, thriving. Thank you, Mr. Corey. And now Dr. Rushing, if you were giving, if you were to give advice to all of the kids watching, what would you say? So I um, was actually trained as a pediatrician prior to working in the emergency department. And really, I think um, the contrast here is I do not think kids need to be told anything right now. I think really what we're seeing is kids wanting to be invested in their communities. Um, and to make that happen, they need evidence that their community is invested in them. Um, that comes down to a strong education system, good funding for our teachers, and good community resources so that kids have opportunities in their immediate vicinity. Yes, we have great opportunities for jobs later on, but to be able to foster a sense of ambition and perseverance, um, and then just general compassion for their surrounding community. Um, I think kids want to be invested now. Um, and those are the things that we need to be providing for them as a community. Thank you, Dr. Rushing. All right, next question. And this, we will start with Dr. Rushing. How do you think your position as state representative can help small businesses recover from COVID-19? Great question. So overall, small businesses, with what we're doing right now, many of them are struggling. They're struggling because we can't fully reopen. And the reason we can't fully reopen is because of the disease burden. Um, what we need to do is manage the pandemic. And with that, we'll be able to reopen our businesses. Small businesses in particular are a mainstay of our communities. Um, they're a mainstay of our communities in Klickitat County. I know they are in Yakima as well. And they really should be prioritized for resources through this pandemic. Um, my opponent seems to be working more with big business at the moment. And I don't think we're effectively prioritizing the small businesses in our district. Thank you, Dr. Rushing. Moving to Mr. Corey. How do you think your position as state representative can help small businesses recover from COVID-19? So wonderful question and a very important question to the 14th Legislative District and something I've actually been actively working on as your state representative. Uh, there's, there's several pieces to this. Um, we are, are currently managing the pandemic through uh, government fiat right now. It is one person's office who makes all the rules and those rules seem to be dictated by who has the, the ear of the governor or who has the ear of the office. And I think that's unfortunate. I've been focused on advocating for getting small businesses opened up. We know we can do it safely. We know we can do it in this current environment. If we can keep large box chain stores open, we can open our small businesses. That's not a question. Um, as far as the recovery piece, I think that's more important and why I've been working with Democrat legislators and Republican legislators to figure out a way to provide some small business relief and we could do that now if we were back in session or if we were allowed to be part of uh, that conversation as is our constitutional duty. Thank you, Mr. Corey. Next question, we'll go start with Mr. Corey. The COVID-19 emergency has greatly affected our healthcare system. In what ways can you work at the state level to help your constituents access affordable quality healthcare when they need it? 
That's an awesome question and something that I've been working on. So one of the problems we have in rural counties is that oftentimes they won't be um, an ideal place for certain healthcare carriers. And there's a variety of reasons to that. The Affordable Care Act has made it uh, extremely challenging for a lot of uh, rural carrier or rural healthcare delivery. So what we need to look at is how do we incentivize and make it easier for those, um, those insurance companies to come in and offer um, additional programs and services. Now, fortunately, we've seen some fruits of, you know, two years of work of working labor here and that um, additional uh, options are going to be coming to rural Washington. And I think that's a start, but we need to look at ways to make that uh, more fruitful and easier for Washingtonians. I think there's obviously a unique challenge for uh, Skamania and Klickitat County in having um, another state right across the border and looking at ways we can make healthcare easier to transfer over state and easier to acquire over state. So it reduces burden on people. Thank you, Mr. Corey. And now Dr. Rushing, the COVID-19 emergency has greatly affected our healthcare system. In what ways can you work at the state level to help our constituents access affordable quality healthcare when they need it? So we need policies across the board that optimize both access and affordability. Um, and our reliance on a private market right now is not serving us well. Um, what we need to focus on affordability is how we're covering people. Um, and I think that conversation is had both at the community level and in the way we do our state policies. Um, but it's basically in, in the sense of we want to be offering preventative care for people. We want to be offering comprehensive mental health treatment as needed, substance abuse. This needs to be comprehensive and that's really where we're failing at the moment. I also feel that access um, in our area is an issue. Um, that comes down to things like broadband, utilizing tools like telemedicine, and so those need to be ongoing conversations as we frame our policies too. Thank you, Dr. Rushing. Moving to our next question. Farm workers are working in smoke right now and COVID outbreaks have been linked to fruit packing. In what ways do you think the state can help farm workers during these types of crises? Dr. Rushing, we'll begin with you. Yeah, so this really comes down to the, the lack of the evidence-based decision-making from the get-go of this pandemic as well. Um, we are putting workers at risk the same as we were at the start of this pandemic. We're not pr prioritizing personal protective equipment. We're not being mindful of the situations that we're putting them in while they're expected to do their work. Um, this is a population that we've been calling essential workers and we're treating them as expendable. And that's not something that's okay moving forward as a community. Um, these are workers that we rely on um, to get our food. Um, these are workers that sustain many of our industries and businesses in this area um, and how we are enabling them to continue working in a safe environment is to all of our benefits. So I think those are things that need to be um, addressed acutely um, and I, I feel we're falling behind. Thank you, Dr. Rushing. Mr. Corey? Farm workers are working in smoke right now and COVID outbreaks have been linked to fruit packing. In what ways do you think the state can help farm workers during these types of crises? So great question. Um, I think that there is stuff being done and there's still more to do. Um, I've worked with groups like the Washington State Tree Fruit Association who've delivered over 100,000 N95 masks. Actually, I was in conversation with their director yesterday, finding out the status of an additional 200,000 that are coming out. Um, I've talked to growers and packers across our valley to find out what they're doing to keep our farm workers safe in the fields when it comes to smoke and protecting them, like using N95 masks, additional respirators, um, and, and so on and so forth. I think that um, a lot of our businesses have adapted quickly and I think adapted relatively well to changing dynamics in this. I mean, when we started this in March, that you know, a lot wasn't known, but I believe that our growers and packers have worked quickly to try to protect their employees and make sure they're uh, kept safe. I'll continue to work with like the Washington Farm Bureau and others to make sure we keep getting the PPE we need from the state. Thank you, Mr. Corey. Next question. What strategies do you have for working across the aisle to build consensus? Mr. Corey, we'll begin with you. So I mentioned in my 
my intro about advocating for Central Washington with West Side legislators. Most of the legislators um, in the other party are from the West Side, with the exception of two. So I've spent a lot of time getting to know them and work with them. I have great personal working relationships with them. I don't let the D by their name stand in the way of, of you know, issues that we have in common. A lot of stuff we vote on together on the House floor goes out unanimous because we agree. Uh, the biggest bill that I worked on passing my freshman year, I was uh, co-sponsored with a Democrat from Seattle. Uh, that, that doesn't come about um, accidentally. It is by uh, getting to know people, working with people, understanding their hearts, and sharing with them your values and finding places you can work together. I've done it repeatedly and I've done it often, even on issues that I know I'm not gonna vote yes on. I've worked with Democrats to say, let me work with you to make this better, even if I'm not to a yes, I can at least help make the process better. So that's important for me as a state legislator and something I will continue to do. Thank you, Mr. Corey. And now Dr. Rushing, what strategies do you have for working across the aisle to build consensus? So when I'm working in the emergency department, one of the things that's most notable to me is how community focused almost everyone in this district is. We all share very similar values and I think that this stratification, this East versus West that Mr. Corey keeps referring to is just frankly false. Um, I think we all have different backgrounds and we do have some different opinions, but there's not a definitive line of how things should be done in central Washington and how things should be done closer to the I-5 corridor. Our priorities are, should be the people and the families in our district. They should be the, the businesses here that sustain us and they should be what in our environment sustains our quality of life. Those are conversations that we can have, not just across the aisle, but as a community. And so we're not continuing to propagate this East versus West dichotomy that again is just antiquated. Thank you, Dr. Rushing. Next question, what is your position on the state COVID-19 emergency proclamation? Dr. Rushing, we'll begin with you. Can you repeat the question? Yes, ma'am. What is your position on the state COVID-19 emergency proclamation? Um, so COVID is an evolving process. Um, I think that the emergency pro proclamation was absolutely appropriate and um, it enabled us to take initial steps to protect our communities. Um, I think that the how we address this pandemic moving forward is going to be something that needs to be, um, it needs to be managed based on the data that we have available. Because this is a new novel virus, it's something that we have to admit that we don't know all the data for right now. But at this current moment in time, based on the disease burden that we're seeing, the burden on our hospital systems, the families getting sick, and the burden on our businesses locally, yes, this is an emergency. The emergency proclamation was 100% appropriate. And to claim otherwise is just honestly somewhat silly. Thank you, Dr. Rushing. Mr. Corey, what is your position on the state COVID-19 emergency proclamation? Thank you very much. And that's a great question. So when the initial emergency order was issued, we were 100% behind our governor uh, and we spoke to that. And we spent two months working to get our resources in place to serve our constituents and conserve our state. Um, after two months, it was clear that this was gonna continue going on and we wanted to have a greater role in that uh, response. Unfortunately, the legislature, the people's body, the people that represent the citizens across the state were kept out. And as we looked further into this, we found out that there are state laws already in place to govern pandemic response. And it actually, the authority relies on the local health districts for those decision making. And, and I think that's a better place for it now moving forward. Um, we've seen some hypocrisy in some of the orders and some of the what is allowed to go on and what's not allowed. I think it's better addressed at a local level with, uh, with local resources. And I think that that's why we need to move in a new direction to provide better local authority to continue moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Corey. As we near the end of tonight's forum, we will now allow the candidates to use their challenge card as neither of them have used it during the course of the forum. This is an opportunity to use it and spend an additional 30 seconds on a topic of your choice from tonight's questions. 
Then the second candidate will also have an opportunity to spend 30 seconds on that topic before we, were, before we move to tonight's final question. Mr. Corey, we will begin with you. Do you have a 30 second challenge that you would like to begin? I wouldn't necessarily like to challenge anything in particular, but I would just continue to say that uh, our, our work that we do in the legislature is, is important and it's vital. And um, I believe coronavirus is real and I believe it's here and I believe it's affecting our community. And our response to that needs to be um, equally as uh, important, but it also needs to follow the law. And we need to make sure that we follow our constitutionally protected powers um, and make sure that representation is of the entire state, not just in one person's office. So I'm going to continue to fight to get our businesses open, to get our kids back in school, and to make sure that we can return to normal as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr. Corey. Dr. Rushing, you have 30 seconds to respond to Mr. Corey. Um, I agree that prioritizing, you know, local decision making when possible is ideal. Um, I think what he's speaking of, however, is somewhat falsely stated, um, given the fact that the resource allocation for large scale emergencies like a national pandemic often come either from the federal government or from the state government. I think we need state input, but I think we need legislators who are actually getting us the resources we need to get through this pandemic, and our current legislators are not doing that. Thank you, Dr. Rushing. And Dr. Rushing, as you have not also used your challenge, you have 30 seconds to redress anything that was in tonight's forum. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, so I don't have any direct challenges myself either. Um, I really just want to focus on how we can come together as a community moving forward. And to echo some of what Mr. Corey's been saying this evening, I do feel like this focus on local involvement is a strength for us. However, putting a wall up and saying we can only do this locally and the extra assistance that we'd be getting by developing policies at the state level isn't going to help us is false. Thank you, Dr. Rushing. And Mr. Corey, you now have 30 seconds to reply. Uh, thank you. And I think that uh, her comment speaks to my point about getting the legislature back involved. Right now, our communities have really no say um, in, in how this is continuing to move forward because all the power is currently held in one office in Olympia. And in order for us to be able to work with those resources and get them where we need, we need to be part of that conversation. And right now, we're not. Um, you know, we'll continue to, or I will continue to work with anyone and everyone to help support our local families and our local businesses. And I think you can do that uh, while respecting our state laws. Thank you, Mr. Corey. Our final question of the evening, please tell us why you are uniquely suited to fill this job. We will begin with Mr. Corey. Well, that is, that's a great question. It almost feels like uh, we're uh, in an interview. So, um, I guess we kind of are, right, as an election. So I've, I've served in the position now for two years. I've learned a lot. I still have more to learn. I think that um, it's a very dynamic environment that you're in, and you, you deal with a lot of uh, stimulus and a lot of input uh, in any given day during session. Um, I've worked on a variety of areas that are important to Central Washington and District 14. Uh, I sit on you know appropriations and capital budget, and all those are very important. Um, one of the things that I've been really able to do well in Olympia is work with anyone and everyone, uh, whether that is the, you know, Democrat commissioner of uh, public lands and getting laws passed and in place that protect our farmers and ranchers to working with Seattle legislators to pass uh, laws to help um, recovering drug addicts and to help with uh, the opioid pandemic. So we'll continue to work there. And I think that that's why I'm uniquely suit suited to uh, be in this position. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Corey. And Dr. Rushing, please tell us why you are uniquely suited to fill this job. Um, so I work in a dynamic and unpredictable work environment um, every day. And I think that that's something that's uniquely prepared me for the role of you know, developing policies and moving our community forward in the midst of this unprecedented time. I think that requires collaboration um, both with your immediate vicinity in your community, but also reaching out at the state and federal levels to move things forward for us as a community. 
What we're not doing right now is tackling this together. There are groups being left behind. There's large percentages of families who are not getting the resources and the protection that they need right now. And our businesses are not getting the support that they need. Our legislators can do better. Um, and I believe that they should be doing better right now. Um, so I'm here to help move that ball forward. And I look forward to continuing conversations with everyone for how best we do that. Thank you, Dr. Rushing. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our questions for the evening. On behalf of the League of Women Voters and tonight's sponsors, the Goldendale Sentinel and the Skamania County Pioneer, thank you to both candidates for your participation this evening. Thank you. Tonight, thank you. Tonight's recorded coverage will be available on YouTube and on the League of Women Voters Facebook page. Be sure to head to vote411.org if you need any other information. And please remember to mark your ballot and return it in time to be counted in the general election on November 3rd. The Postal Service recommends that voters mail their ballots at least one week prior to the election. Voters who choose to use community drop boxes should drop your ballot off by 8 p.m. on election day. Klickitat County has 11 drop boxes and Skamania County has six drop box locations. Please go to your county auditor's website for the exact locations. Again, Thank you all for attending this evening. Please join us again at 7 p.m. this evening for a forum with the candidates for the Washington State Office of Legislative District 14 State Representative Position 2, Gina Mossbrooker and Devin Q. Thank you all and goodbye. Thank you.